So welcome to the session on post-quantum cryptography. We have three talks. And uh, the first talk has a large list of authors. So Mingxing Chen, Andreas Hulsing, Joost Reinevelt, Simona and Peter Shavaba. And uh, Joost Reinevelt is going to give the talk. So So I'm going to talk about um, building MQ-based signatures from five pass uh, MQ-based identification schemes. Um, yeah, let's just start. Why do we want to do this? So the problem is we want to have signatures in a post-quantum setting. Um, the current signature schemes are not going to cut it when uh, quantum computers arise, and um, we want to have a secure signature scheme. Basically, we want two things. We want secure security arguments for these schemes so that we know that we can trust them, and we want them to be acceptably f spe uh, fast and, and reasonably small in terms of signatures and key sizes. You can debate about what is acceptable here, but let's just assume we have some notion of what is it. For now, let's just assume we have acceptable as a term. There's a bunch of people that have already uh, come up with solutions. There's a hash based um, There's a lattice based There's some schemes based on CPU. They all have upsides and downsides. Um, we're going to focus on MQ here. Um, and for MQ, the current situation is that um, the stuff that's out there, the security is not very clear. Um, many of them have been broken. There's some that still stand. Um, and we're going to try and base a signature scheme on MQ that is a bit more conservative. Um, but before we get to that, let's first go for the general construction. Um, and an overview of what we're going to do in this work. Uh, first, we're going to, in general, transform five-pass identification schemes into signature schemes. To do this, we extend the fiat Shamir transformation. Um, this is typically traditionally defined for uh, classical IDSs. I'll talk about it later in a bit. Um, then we'll show that an earlier attempt to do exactly this uh, did not suffice. Um, and then we're going to look at a, sp a specific application of this and then look at an MQ-based signature scheme that you can obtain by using this transformation. Um, this signature scheme bases its hardness on the MQ problem, which I'll also introduce in a bit. And then we instantiate and implement and show how fast this is and how big it is. Um, there are some footnotes. There's stuff we don't do. Um, the reduction is in the random oracle model, model and not in the QROM. Um, the proof is also non-tight. There is a reduction, but yeah. So uh, let's get started with some preliminaries. The canonical identification scheme, so this is the typical three-pass identification scheme. The prover commits to uh, some random value using the secret key. Uh, sends these commits over to uh, the verifier. He comes up with challenges. The prover um, computes responses based on the challenge that he gets and sends these over. The verifier checks if these responses match uh, what he would expect based on the commits and the challenges or the commit and the challenge. Um, so this is a tr traditional setting. Um, and then what do we require of this identification scheme? We require it to be passively secure. Um, and we define security in terms of soundness, that, uh, which means the probability that the adversary can convince uh, a verifier should be small. So an, uh, only a real prover that knows the secret key can, con can convince a verifier. Um, and we also want it to be honest verifier zero knowledge so that um, basically uh, the verifier could simulate the entire transcript showing that uh, he does not uh, know the secret and he is able to like compute one of these conversations without actually knowing the secret. Um, like if you go 
from the, the bottom up, uh, this is a convincing way to show that your secret is not actually leaking. So for soundness, um, there is some chance that the adversary can guess right. We define this with the soundness error kappa. Uh, this should be small enough um, so that, uh, yeah, this is negligible uh, to some extent, but for one, one round of the IDS, this is, would typically be like a half or two thirds, something along those lines. Um, but we'll come back to that. So um, how do we turn this into signatures? We apply the fiat Shamir transform. But before doing that, we first need to get rid of the soundness error. I just mentioned it. Typically, this is uh, a number of the order of a half or two thirds. And by uh, composing a lot of instances of this IDS in parallel, um, we can reduce this. Because basically, you're multiplying the soundness error for each parallel composition that you're doing. Uh, so you compose until you get to a negligible level of, of error in your security parameter k. Um, and then we transform this into signatures. Um, the end result is non-interactive, so we, before we had this two-party thing where you had a prover and a verifier. Now we just want to have a prover that computes, computes the signature. Um, so the signer is the prover, um, and he uses some hash function to, or some function h to uh, compute challenges, which he then responds to, and this conversation ends up being the signature. Um, and we want to generalize this, uh, because this is the, the classical three-pass se setting. But uh, by scaling it up to five pass, uh, you can benefit from a lower soundness error. Uh, typically, the, the three pass schemes would have a higher soundness error, and then you would need to have more uh, in composition. But uh, generalizing this to a different uh, setting could uh, make, a, make for a more efficient scheme that has less rounds, so a smaller transcript and easier to compute. But then the, the current fiat Shamir transform uh, works on like the, the canonical IDS that I just showed. Um, so that's where we're aiming at now. So as I mentioned before, there was an earlier attempt to do this. In 2012, at Africa Crypt, uh, a paper appeared that uh, defined n soundness um, to apply a fiat Shamir transform to any 2n plus 1 pass uh, signature scheme. And basically what they uh, did, they said, if you have two, two transcripts that uh, agree up to the last challenge, and then you can extract the, the secret key, then you have uh, this property called end soundness and then the transform applied. Um, we show that this actually does not um, gain you anything because all the schemes where this would apply uh, can be transformed back to three paths. So you can restructure the, um, such an IDS. Uh, basically what we're doing is we show that if you have some three pass IDS, um, you can uh, um, prove honest verifiers your knowledge by taking, uh, for example, if you're going from a five pass, you would combine the first three messages into one, then get a three pass scheme. And for special soundness, you would uh, show that you can extract from some three pass scheme using the extractor that this five pass scheme would provide. Basically, you're proving an equivalent three pass scheme based on an existing five pass scheme that has this property, um, which would be great, because then you could apply the traditional fiat, uh, uh, fiat Shamir transform to this resulting three pass scheme only uh, none of the existing five pass or seven pass schemes, or whatever pass schemes apply, or because they don't satisfy this condition. There's no such extractor that from two of these transcripts you can actually get the secret key. Um, then the authors ended up fixing it in the journal version of this paper this year, um, and they redefined, and now it doesn't reduce the three pass anymore, but still it does not apply to existing schemes. Um, so that's the gap where, where our work comes in. What we're doing is we're uh, doing a fiat Shamir transform for specifically five pass as opposed to two n plus one pass, um, and we're restricting it to a very specific instance. So we're looking at schemes that have to form uh, the first challenge. So if you're doing five pass, you typically have two of these challenge phases. For the first challenge phase, you take a challenge from some queue, so that is a, is a parameter you define, and the second one is a binary challenge. So it's either a zero or one. That restricts the um, the, the, the setting we're in. So it's not a general five pass scheme, but one that confines to these uh, limitations. And then we're gonna prove that this is uh, uh, CMA using, an unfortunately, anyway, we're gonna prove this using a dedicated uh, instance of the forking lemma specifically tailored to this uh, Q2 IDS uh, constraint. Um, basically we assume a successful forgery 
uh, then we generate uh, four signatures uh, following a pattern on like these specific challenges. You would uh, have, for the first challenge, you would have one that agrees and one that disagrees, and then for the second one, also one that agrees and disagrees. This is uh, a very specific pattern for these uh, that follows from the fact that this is a binary uh, second challenge. And then we can uh, obtain four of these traces um, and use an extractor to show that this uh, uh, works. Um, this would apply to like IDSs that follow this pattern. Now, um, before uh, going into the, the very specific instance that we're applying this to, because this looks like where we have some instance in mind where this condition holds, uh, let's first look at the uh, context of this, the hardness problem, the, the hard problem that we're basing this on. That's the multivariate quadratics, uh, the MQ problem. And it's defined as follows. We take a function family MQ over some M, N, and FQ. Um, and all of these are polynomials that um, are quadratic. So basically, they consist of quadratics, uh, quadratic uh, terms and uh, linear terms. And they have coefficients. And together, all these uh, coefficients make up an instance of uh, such a problem. So basically, the problem is given some uh, output of this function family um, for some input, you need to find the pre-image x that went into it. So basically, you're solving a, a system of equations um, where you have uh, coefficients a and b, and uh, you input the x's and then get the y's out. Then going back, if you have this y factor, you cannot easily find the x's. Um, that's in a nutshell the, the, the hard problem that's behind this. Um, and then we're looking at an identification scheme that uses this. Now, I'm not expecting you to read this protocol in detail, but uh, just to get a, a general idea of um, what this IDS would look like. Um, well, it looks like this five pass uh, setting that we're looking for, it has the first challenge alpha comes from some FQ, and then the second challenge CH2 comes from like the set zero one, so that's a binary challenge. Uh, first, the prover commits to some random, uh, randomly chosen vectors from uh, FQN, commits to these, um, response to the challenge alpha. There's uh, an evaluation of f there. That's this MQ problem that we just discussed. Um, and there's also g up there, which is a, va uh, a variant on this. I'll come back to that on the next slide. Um, basically, this follows exactly the pattern that we just uh, looked at, like uh, the assumptions that the proof would hold for. Um, so this is the, the scheme that we're going to look at. So. How does the scheme work in a bit more detail? It relies on just the MQ problem. Typically, MQ um, schemes based on the MQ problem would also have other related problems, which typically introduce the security problems that we've seen with other uh, schemes based on this problem. They would rely on uh, isomorphism of polynomials or other related problems. And then people would claim that they are based on this MQ problem, but there's also related problems. And these typically lead to attacks. Well, for this scheme, it's only this um, MQ problem that we're uh, looking at, because th that's the only thing we're evaluating here. Um, and what uh, Sakamoto et al. did in this for this IDS, they showed that you can uh, take this MQ problem and split it into parts, um, split the secret into parts, and then yeah, using a bilin some bi bilinear function that I won't go into detail here, but uh, this allows them to split it in such a way that you can either reveal these uh, three factors or the other three factor factors, which basically um, give you the responses of, of the prover here. And this shows that you can have some sort of proof where uh, uh, you're, you're proving knowledge of either one half of the secret without revealing the other half, because uh, the split is, is random and uh, does not allow you to compute the other half of this uh, secret S. I won't go into details uh, on this any further, but that's the general idea. Um, so what do we do with this? Basically, now we build a signature scheme out of this by applying the fiat Shamir transform we saw earlier. Um, we start by sampling some seed and uh, picking a random uh, a secret key value that serves as the x for our problem f. Basically, we had, you had this, f, oh, this, this x of uh, input elements that would go into uh, capital F uh, to evaluate to get to some y. Here, SK is the X and PK is the Y. Um, and that instance is basically our, our key. Uh, 
and then we take some C to sample F from, because F is this large uh, set of all the coefficients, and it would be very impractical to have this as part of your key, so you would typically just have a C to expand this from. Uh, you could also have this as a system parameter, but yeah, that's not necessarily uh, a reason to do that instead of just having it as part of your key. Um, so how, what does signing look like? We sign some random digest M o uh, D over M, so we like hash it and then uh, use this as, a, as an it's uh, input uh, bit string. And then we perform R rounds of this IDS. Basically, we're doing this VHC mirror transform where we first parallelized uh, the, this IDS. We've made a composition of R instances of uh, the, the identification scheme. And this consists of doing two R commits, because you saw earlier um, that there's two R or two commits per uh, instance of this. And there's also two R evaluations of uh, this MQ function. That there's F and there's G up there. Um, I'm not sure how legible this is, but people in the back will just have to believe me on this. Um, so there's two R commits, some multiplications in FQ for this challenge alpha, and then two R MQ evaluations. And in terms of how much effort this is, like where does the computation go, um, these commits are just applications of hash functions or uh, yeah, some string bit commitment. But these two R evaluations of MQ, that's the, the, the costly part. And then, of course, there's some size, so we can uh, play a few tricks to reduce the signature size. That's typically the bottleneck here. You don't want to have a, a very large signature, and you want to somehow limit this to as much as you can. Um, and you can do this in a couple ways. One of uh, a few of the tricks we pull is you only include the necessary uh, commits. Basically, the verifier reconstructs one of the two commits. Uh, and the other one you would need to supply, but the one that the verifier is, is um, reconstructing anyway, you wouldn't need to make part of the signature. Um, and you could in commit to seeds that instead of uh, committing to like uh, full sets of random uh, data, you could uh, commit to some seed that produces this random data and then later uh, reveal the seed. For our parameters, that last trick didn't apply, but in, in general, it could work. Um, and then how does verifying work? Basically, bottom up of, of the same story. You reconstruct uh, the digest and this uh, system parameter f, because the seed is part of the public key. Anyone can just reconstruct f. Um, you reconstruct the challenges from whatever is part of the signature, because the, the prover used the message and is commits to generate the challenges. You verify the responses. Um, you reconstruct the missing commits that we omitted by only including the necessary ones. Um, and then you check if the commits that were omitted actually match whatever checksum or hash or whatever was included to uh, account for like leaving out half of these. And then there's a bunch of parameters that we leave out uh, that we've omitted to give instances of so far. So there's k, the uh, security parameter, and there's n and m, the dimensions of our MQ problem, where n is the number of inputs and m is the number of outputs. We're doing this over some finite field FQ. Um, there's a commit function, there's a bunch of hash functions, and there's uh, random number generators. So let's now look at a specific instance of this. So MQDSS3164 is what we define as the, the instance in our uh, work. Um, for some security parameter, K is 256. This results in a general uh, post quantum security of 128 bit. Um, and then we have some soundness error kappa that depends on Q, so that makes it important to choose a Q that is uh, not two. Typically, people would choose Q is two for one of these problems, but then if you um, increase Q, kappa uh, declines, so you would need to have less of these composed IDSs in parallel, which makes it interesting to choose a slightly larger Q. So we go for Q is 31, and N and M are 64. These are uh, restricted by uh, attacks that would uh, be feasible if you have lower M and M, N and M, or you would have them uh, vary because you could have a slightly larger n and a slightly smaller m, for example, or the other way around. Um, but they are also uh, an artifact of wanting to uh, choose nice parameters for code. Um, I'll come back to that briefly in a second. Um, and then there's a bunch of functions that you would need. We have some commit and c some commitments, some hashes, some pseudo-random number generators. All of this is not really uh, much of a factor in terms of how fast the scheme becomes. Um, so we use uh, the, the reasonable choice of just going with uh, catch functions here. Um, so in 
to summarize, the signature then contains some R to have the randomized message digest, um, some hash over these commits that we're leaving out, and then for each of the rounds, there's going to be 269 of those. Um, we have these response factors T, E, and R, and one of the commits that uh, you would need to include that the verifier cannot reconstruct, so you would need to include half of them, um, which comes down to roughly 40 kilobytes of uh, signature size. So a slightly more detailed look at how this MQ problem works. Um, so going from fx to x should be hard, but from x to fx is something we do uh, a bunch of times during the evaluation of this, uh, during the cre uh, creation of the signature, so basically evaluating this fx, and uh, that should be easy. And when I say easy, I mean fast. Um, basically, you look at the MQ problem as uh, a triangle. You have a bunch of axes on the x-axis, a bunch of axes on the y-axis. What we're trying to do is we're multiplying each of those to create the quadratic terms. Um, and then you have a dimension, basically, for each of the, the coefficients A um, that you would have for every uh, element in the output factor. Um, where you're basically evaluating one triangle per, output per element in the output. Um, but yeah, triangles are not that great to work with, so what we're trying to do is go to a rectangle. Um, and that's also where the, um, and the, the parameters come in, because then we want to have a rectangle that fits nicely in, into registers. And then we look at, um, we earlier discussed we had N and M is 64, and then we have elements in F31, and these elements are nicely represented in five bits, or, um, you can place them into slightly larger spaces, or you either put them in eight or sixteen bits, and then have some okay, have some space uh, uh, to do your your computations. Um, so this all fits uh, fits nicely in, in uh, yeah the architect architecture we're targeting here. That was like a reason to also come up with these parameters um, to give you some conclusions and benchmarks. The signatures are. 40k, which is roughly what Sphinx is also getting. Sphinx is uh, a very, like uh, the the current state of the art uh, hash based signature scheme, which is the most conservative signature choice you could uh, make seem to make right now. Um, there's public and private keys of uh, six, uh, 72 uh, and 64 bytes, so those are uh, very small. Th it's the a result of choosing just a seed and this input to the MQ function. Uh, signing time is, yeah. Uh, and not comparable to lattice-based signatures, but definitely faster than what Sphinx is getting. Verification and key gen are similarly reasonably okay. Um, but more importantly, um, or also important, we now have a general fiat Shamir transform for IDSs of the form Q2. Um, yeah, and we present a, a signature scheme that actually uh, does competitive signatures with a reduction to just the MQ problem. That's it. Oh, uh, code is publicly available and public domain and that's it. Question? No questions? I'll ask a quick question then. So I was interested in whether you can do something bypass that would make um, code-based signatures more efficient. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, so um, actually in the journal version of uh, the, the paper I referenced earlier, where they I had this, this updated version, they also present the code-based signature scheme. Um, and while their reduction does not immediately apply, uh, ours would apply because it's of the, the same form. It's, it's a Q2 idea, so we typically what we're doing here would directly apply. I'm not sure about what the performance would be like or what the sizes would be like, but yeah, it would definitely work. <laughs>
is why we're not accepting PowerPoint in the rump session. my USB stick. Huh. Does it work? I don't know why it's working. Uh, so please uh, send us the slide before the session or you can put your slide uh, on the computer of the conference before the session. I did try before the session. <laughs> and it doesn't work? Okay. The problem is that the conference computer does not have PowerPoint, so... No, no, uh, no. It's we did. No, you don't. Okay. You have, have WPS Office. What? What? I can... I, I can... The laptop that was here before didn't have PowerPoint. No, you don't. I tr I mean, uh, you didn't earlier when I tried. Yeah. not PowerPoint. That's WPS Office. But I, that's not the newest version. Yeah. Yes, but it will not be correct. Yeah, hmm? yeah just put it there. Yeah, I know that. I, there I can see the time. It's my clock. Yeah, so. <coughs> yeah, got it. Okay, my apologies for the delay. Uh, some of the appearings of text will be in the wrong order because uh, this is not PowerPoint um, on this laptop, but uh, it should be all understandable anyway. Okay, so I'm going to talk about collapse binding quantum commitments without random oracles, and if you don't know what collapse binding commitments are, that's not a problem. I will start by um, motivating them and telling you why we have them. 
so for this, I would first like to give you a, um, an example of something we could do and which is reali realistic to do. So let's say we have a horse race as just a use case example. And uh, a player wants to, uh, so we want to, produ um, to construct a commitment in order to um, allow a player to commit, uh, to bet on a horse without telling the bookie beforehand what he committed to. So that's a kind of a typical teaching example for commitments. And how can we do that? Well, for example, For example, we could take the name of the horse, Spicy Spirit, in this example, and take a hash of that name together with some randomness and send this both together to the bookie. And now let's say the Spicy Spirit is the horse that wins. What does the player do? He sends the randomness to the bookie. The bookie checks whether this uh, the name of the horse together with the randomness gives the right hash, and if so, pays the money. So that's a typical approach that we might do. And now we can ask ourselves, is this a secure protocol or not? So consider a cheating player. Could the cheating player, so we are looking at the binding property now, the hiding property is not the topic of this talk. So could a um, cheating player achieve the following? So instead of actually hash sending the hash of some horse name, he just sends some fake value h that he made up in whichever way he likes, and sends this value h to the bookie. And later, when some other horse wins, say Walloping Waldo, um, the player performs some algorithm to find an r so that the hash of Walloping Waldo and r equals the value h he sent earlier, and the bookie sends money. So this would be a typical attack. And now I ask, is this possible? Well. If we do not specify anything about the hash function, so this is what the player wants to do, if we don't say anything, of course it could be possible, it could be that the hash function is uh, the all zero function or something like this. But I guess everyone here, oops, yeah, uh, only this should have appeared. So I guess everyone here knows that in classical cryptography, all we need to do is to take a collision resistant hash function here. Because collision resistance means that it is infeasible to find two different inputs to this function that have the same hash. And therefore, the player cannot find one input which is wo contains Walloping Waldo and another input that contains Spicy Spirit that have the same hash. So the consequence is that H can be open to one horse only and not two. And now comes the big surprise. In the quantum setting, so if the adversary has a, potentially has a quantum computer, this reasoning does not hold. So it could be that H is collision resistant, <coughs> in even collision resistant against quantum adversaries, but still it is possible that the player unveils to any horse he pleases, at least relative to some um, rather artificial oracles, such a hash function has been explicitly constructed in prior work. Um, so the question, well, the first question you might ask is, is this even possible? Although this is not the topic of the paper here, I would like to tell you a word or two why it is possible in principle that this can happen, because otherwise you might stop listening because you think I'm solving a problem that can't happen. So why could it be that um, such an attack is possible with a collision resistant hash function? Well, on a very high level, what could happen is that the player sends some fake value h, and this fake value h is produced during, is with some quantum algorithm that does not compute only the value h, but also computes some quantum state psi. So it's a randomized quantum algorithm that outputs each time you run it an h and a quantum state together. So you can't just first pick the h and then compute to the quantum state. They just come together. And then later, when the player knows what horse he wants, there's some other algorithm that Co computes from psi the randomness needed to open to that value. And now since quantum states cannot be cloned in general, um, we see that there's no contradiction to the col um, collision resistance. 
Because this algorithm here will use up psi, we can do it only once. So we can open this hash function to whatever we want, but we cannot open it to two values at the same time. In particular, we cannot find a collision. And uh, this has been explicitly done relative to some oracles. So it seems to be a, a threat that is at least possible. So the question is, also um, already done in uh, this year's Eurocrypt, what do we do against this? How, uh, how do we improve the commitment schemes in order to avoid what I call here the walloping Waldo attack? And there were two contributions. One was the definition of a stronger property of computational binding, because it turns out if you just use one-to-one -one the definition of computational binding that is used in the classical setting, uh, even the definition is uh, does not exclude this attack. So there's an improved definition called collapse binding. Um, I will not show you that definition for time reasons, but um, let me tell you that it does sh uh, imply that you cannot cheat in this example that I showed you. Uh, it is nice because it composes in parallel and it is um, rewinding friendly. So um, even in proofs that use rewinding, which are particularly tricky in the quantum setting, like when you use, for example, um, zero knowledge proofs and so on, uh, these commitments behave nicely. But the question is then, do they, they exist? Well, and that was the second contribution. Another notion was introduced, a security notion for hash functions, uh, called collapsing hash functions. And that, uh, it was shown that with simple, with kind of standard constructions from the classical world, a collapsing hash function implies a collapse binding commitment. So a commitment that is good for all purposes that we know. Um, collapsing is a strengthening of the notion of collision resistance. And in, well, I claim it is um, what we actually want from a hash function in a post-quantum uh, setting. And it was shown that such functions exist in the random oracle model. But the big question that remained open is do collapsing hash functions actually also exist in the standard model? Yeah. Because you could claim, well, I make up some definition and then I show the random oracle satisfies it, but perhaps it's an impossible to achieve definition. So the, um, the goal of the present paper is to um, show that collapsing hash functions exist in the standard model, so without random oracles. And in particular, this then also uh, implies the existence of collapse binding commitments in the standard model. So it solves all the problems that I've mentioned so far, at least. Not all the problems in the world. So that was a bad button. Which one was it? Ah, this way. OK. So um, yeah. It, appeared too much again, but never mind. So um, let me first tell you now what, collapse, uh, what a collapsing hash function is. So I will now um, show you the definition. I'm showing you the definition here a bit differently than it is in the paper, because after the paper, I came up with a bit more intuitive way of phrasing it. But it, is, uh, it can be easily seen to be equivalent. So consider a hash function. And now we want to generalize the idea of um, being collision resistant to the quantum setting. And in the classical setting, collision resistant means we cannot find two values that have the same hash at the same time. In the quantum setting, as we have seen, this is not enough. Instead, we will ask for something which, at least on the vague intuitive level, means we cannot find a superposition of two values that have the same hash. And this is formalized as follows. So as, um, we look at an adversary that outputs a number of messages M in superposition. There should be outputs here. So here we have an adversary. He outputs a bunch of messages M. And then we take this bunch of messages, uh, the superposition of messages, and measure which one it is. And we give that, the state after the measurement, back to the adversary. So quantum mechanics tells us that if the adversary produces a bunch of messages here and we measure them, what we give him back is not a superposition of messages, but randomly chosen one out of, many uh, one out of the messages that um, 
well in this superposition. And now this we contrast with the second game, where again the adversary produces the superposition of messages, but now instead of measuring which message he sends, we only measure the hash of the message. So we perform a measurement that takes less information about the quantum state. And that means that whatever the adversary gets back will be a superposition of several messages, or potentially a superposition of several messages that all have the same hash that we have measured. Because we have narrowed the superposition down to all messages that have the same hash. And now the definition of collapsing is in principle very simple. It says that an adversary cannot tell whether he runs in this setting or whether he runs in this setting. What does this intuitively mean? Intuitively, if we ignore all the issues like computational limitations and so on, and just think information theoretically, it means that measuring m and measuring the hash of m do the same thing to the state. And, doing this, um, and that means that the information content of measuring m and the information content of measuring hash of m is the same. In other words, measuring the hash tells you the same as measuring the message, which basically means there is no collision. This was some information theoretical argument. Of course, a hash function will have collisions. They are just hard to find. Um, but this should be enough for now to have a vague feeling about why the definition is like, like it is. It's basically, we are, the hash function is supposed to look as if it wasn't possible to, make, to send a superposition of different messages with the same hash. OK, so that's the definition. And now the question, do they exist? And I will sketch the construction that we found um, on a high level. And the main tool that we use for this construction are lossy functions. You may have heard of lossy trapdoor functions. Lossy functions is the same, except that we don't need a trapdoor, so we slightly weaken the requirements. Um, and a lossy function is a function keyed by some public parameter, which can exist in two different kinds. So depending on the parameter, the function is either injective or it is highly non-injective in the sense that the image of this function is concentrated on a rather small set of its range. And the lossy function definition says it is, um, you cannot distinguish between these two kinds of parameters. And this we will use. So the construction is this one. We take a message, and, and the, the size of these uh, blocks here um, represent like how many bits um, the different inputs and outputs are, so that you see where it expands, where it gets smaller. So we take the message and feed it through a lossy function. Now, the bit length of the output of a lossy function is considerably longer than what we put in. So it wouldn't be a good hash function. But by definition of a lossy function, the lossy function always looks injective. No matter whether we use a lossy parameter or an injective parameter, it will always look like it's an injective function. And an injective function is easily seen to be a collapsing function, because an injective function doesn't even have collisions. So in particular, you will not be able to have a superposition of collisions. So a lossy function is a collapsing function but a collapsing function with a range that is bigger than the domain, so that's so far pointless. However, if we run the lossy function in the lossy mode, then although the range here is very big, the actual image that is used here will be a very small subset of this, so much smaller than, the, than this box hash in the end. So we have many bits, but only very few uh, bit strings are actually possible. And now, we use a universal hash function, and we can very easily show that if you have a, apply a universal hash function um, to a set that is very small, then this universal hash function is with, with very high probability injective. So when the key here is lossy, then this hash function will be injective on the actual image of this lossy function, and therefore will be col collapsing. So the con concatenation of these two functions will be collapsing, and the output will actually be shorter than the message. 
So now we have managed to construct a collapsing function that takes a, a, a message of some length and makes a hash of shorter lengths from it. Are we done now? Well, it depends. Um, for some purposes, that may be good enough, but generally we would like hash functions that can take a long, a very, very long message and bring it to a short hash. While here, the more we want to compress, the stronger the assumption about the lossy function uh, will become. So we would actually prefer to have ni a simple computational assumption, I mean, weak as weak as possible assumptions, which means that ideally we will cut off only a few bits or perhaps half the size, but not make like a gigabyte into a, uh, a kilobyte or something. So what we need to do is to hash long messages. Um, I need the text here. It will come soon, yeah. OK. So um, how do we hash long messages? Well, in classical crypto, there are many constructions that are well known. And in particular, for our purpose, the merkel damgard construction turns out to work. So if the hash function, now I get rid of these again. So if the hash function h is, a, um, is collapsing, but takes two blocks into one block, then a construction like this, like we hash part of the first block of the message, get something, connect, concatenate with the second block, hash it, concatenate with the third, hash it, and so on, with some suitable padding, this is a collapsing hash function. Why is that the case? Well, what we need to show is measuring the hash is equivalent to measuring everything that goes in. And I will sketch that. So assume we measure the hash here. This, because this hash function on its own is collapsing, is indistinguishable from also measuring the inputs to that function. And now this output of this function is measured, which will be indistinguished from measuring this and those inputs, and so on. So this is a bit simplified because we can't do an induction over the length because it's dynamic, et cetera. Um, but the basic intuition of what's happening is captured by this. And that means that measuring the hash of the function is indistinguished from measuring the input. And we said that is what we mean by a collapsing hash function. So I have more results, but no time. So I skip them. Um, and I only mentioned my main interesting question. The main interesting question is, can we construct collapsed binding commitments on even weaker assumptions? So can we do it perhaps with one way functions or with collision resistant hash functions? Because lossy chapter functions are already a relatively powerful tool. So we would like to ideally do it with one way functions because classically we can do computationally binding statistically hiding commitments even using just one way functions. So that's an open question. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, dealing with the technical issue, but still finishing on time. I'm impressed. So we have actually time for a quick question. Classical hash functions might uh, give you problems in the in the quantum world, uh, but so can you tell me whether SHA two or SHA three have any <laughs> any chances of exhibiting this weird behavior? Well, um, so since the random oracle on its own is collapsing, so if we assume that SHA three is like a random oracle or SHA two, then we are on the safe side. Um, of course, it's not clear whether this is true, but basically in the classical setting we make a similar thing. We say the building, the compression function behaves ideally and therefore it's also collision resistant. So I don't see any problems um, with those functions, um, especially since, for example, for SHA-2, um, the building block is kind of done by, I don't know, throwing the bits around heavily enough so that everything looks random. And then we build the full hash function using uh, merkel damgard which has been shown secure here. So with SHA-3, I'm very confident that everything is fine uh, with SHA-2. With SHA-3, we don't use the um, merkel damgard We use the sponge construction. Um, there, I'm also pretty confident, but that we, um, is based on unpublished proofs that I only have on my whiteboard so far. So 
the sponge construction is, um, yeah, so one needs to additionally analyze the sponge construction, which is a bit difficult, different because it doesn't seem to be indifferentiable in the quantum model and so on. Um, but if you trust scribbling on my whiteboard, then everything is fine there as well. Okay, great, thanks. All right, uh, yeah, thanks Dominic for your talk. Thank you.